Hello, my name is Thomas Nyman and I am the Major Tim Dot Space 2022-2023 STEM for Him Young Ambassador and I will be interviewing Mike Mullane. Hi, Tom. How are you? Yeah, I'm uh, astronaut Mike Mullane. I flew three times in space and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay, so let's start off with what started your interest in space? Well, at a very early age, I was 12 years old when Sputnik was launched, which started the space race. And it was shortly after that, that uh, they started having astronauts, John Glenn, uh, those type of people. And I wanted to be an astronaut as soon as I heard the word. And in my life, I uh, went to West Point, which is a military academy, got an engineering degree. I went into the Air Force, uh, was flying in the back seat of fighter jets in the Air Force and Along the way, I got a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. I went back to college for that. Uh, and then in 1976, NASA announced they were being they were selecting astronauts for the new space shuttle program. And I applied uh, to be to be in that first group of space shuttle astronauts. And I was fortunate enough to get selected. And I went on to fly three space space shuttle missions. Wow. So what fascinates you about space? Everything fascinating. When I was your age, I, I, I read everything there was to read about space, about science. Uh, I was very interested in, in anything associated with the sky, astronomy, meteorology. I'd go out and watch meteor showers. Uh, if, if there was a eclipse, uh, anything, any celestial uh, event, I was out there to, uh, looking at. And uh, I was growing up in a town here in the United States that was on the, it's a desert uh, community and, and it had very dark skies. So it was easy to go out at night and see uh, things like meteor showers or, and as soon as they started launching satellites bright enough to see, they would publish the times at which these satellites would be coming over. And I'd go over, go out and watch the at sunrise and sunset to watch, or twilight to watch these satellites streak over. So uh, I, everything about, about space and science, and I was interested in it all. Yeah. So um, have you always wanted to be an astronaut or were there other careers that you um, had in your mind as alternatives? Well, I, I always wanted to be an astronaut, but uh, I knew, fortunately, all of my passion was focused on aviation and, and space. So uh, I, I was getting a degree in engineering. And so that uh, I knew I was going to work somewhere in that in that world. Uh, I wanted to be an astronaut, mm -hmm. but the chances of being selected as an astronaut were very low. Uh, so I I would have gone into uh, engineering, working in a contractor that's developing rockets. I probably would have ended up doing that if I had not been selected as an astronaut. Yeah. So kind of similar. So obviously in space, you can't have ordinary food in the sense that you have to do all the processes and everything. So what was the food like in space? Yeah, the food uh, on the space shuttle now, we carry dehydrated food, which is like camping food. It's packaged in plastic containers. There was a plastic cover on the top and there was a machine that would pierce the plastic and squirt water into it. And then you would mix the rub your fingers across the plastic to mix the food and the water up. And then you would take a, a pair of scissors and cut off the top and peel it back, hold it close to your face and eat with a fork and spoon, uh, just like you would eat here on Earth. Uh, the food was sticky enough that it would, you know, stay kind of clumped and you could steer it toward your mouth. Can't eat in a hurry or you have food flying everywhere. Um, but that's how we would uh, we would eat out of those containers. Now, I think. I, I, I'm not sure, but I suspect on the International Space Station, they have resupply missions that go up there. So I suspect they have fresh food sometimes up there, fresh, fresh fruit, fruit, fresh vegetables, things like that. I, that's my guess. Um, but probably a lot better than what we had. But on the shuttle, you're only up there for less than a week, mostly. And so it, eating camping food for a week was no big deal. Yeah. Um, so when you were younger in school, what were your favorite subjects? I love science and math, but really I look back on it and I was interested in everything. I liked English. I liked reading. I liked history. 
um, you know, I, yeah, I was, I, I just wanted to learn. I had a, I had a intense interest in, in most topics, most subjects. Uh, I, I can't recall any that I just didn't like. <laughs> Uh, later on, I had a difficulty with chemistry. <laughs> that was one science yeah. that I struggled with. And then uh, another thing that I wasn't a fan of was learning foreign languages. I just have no no gift for that. I tried, but yeah. I couldn't do that. Uh, Which languages were you? Well, I, was try I was studying German, and uh, I don't think I can speak two words of German now. <laughs> yeah. So how do you wash in space? Because like obviously with the with the anti gravity and everything, the water would just float around, wouldn't it? Right. Yes, it would. Uh, you can't take a bath or shower in space. The only way, and I suspect this is true on the space station too, uh, is to wet a washcloth and wipe your skin off. Um, your water, first of all, is heavy and it's precious. I mean. Uh, on the space shuttle, surprisingly, we had plenty of water because we we had fuel cells that generated our electricity. And yeah. so we carried up liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen that was combined in a fuel cell that made electricity. But the waste of that process was water. So we had plenty of water, but still you can't, you know, like you said, it float all over the place. So you can't uh, have a shower or a bath. So just wet a washcloth and wipe your skin off. Now on the international space station they don't have fuel cells so all the water that's coming to a space space station has to be brought up and that's heavy mm -hmm. and so i'm sure and i shouldn't say i'm sure i suspect that they are restricted on the use of water just to all they can do is just wet a washcloth and wipe their skin off too. it's disgusting frankly yeah. that was the worst thing about being in space is not being able to take a shower um yeah. every once in a while i mean i was only up a week I can't imagine being up there for a better part of a year on an international mm -hmm. space station and never was be the longest to was the longest that you were ever up there just a week yeah the longest was six days the space shuttle as the name implies shuttle it was never designed to stay in space for a long time we had no batteries we had no solar power the shuttle was designed to just carry crews to what was thought to be an international space station right after the shuttle was built they thought that, oh we'll build an international space station immediately and the shuttle will take people and experiments up to it and bring people and test results back yeah. but the space station nasa didn't have enough money to develop a space station right away so the shuttle was used for other things before it was able to uh go up and build a space station and yeah. so it was never designed to be up there in space for long periods of time. So my longest mission was six days. I think the longest shuttle mission ever was 17 days. So it wasn't, yeah. it couldn't stay up. It didn't have batteries and it didn't have solar power. Yeah. So you mentioned before that you studied languages. Did that come in handy um, for your career as an astronaut? Or, it it didn't come handy. <laughs> it didn't come in handy to me because uh, I was flying with all you know, American crews. Nowadays, it does come in very handy for people who can speak French, Russian, uh, Spanish, you know, uh, languages like that, uh, particularly Russian. And well, I know Russian because of the fact we have Russians on the International Space Station uh, is is something that probably comes in very handy for people that can speak it. Yeah. So what was your most memorable moment in space? Oh, well, there's a lot of them, but I'll I have to say the most memorable moment was when on my very first mission, the engines quit. We were in orbit. Uh, I was sitting behind there. Well, let me go back. When you launch, you know, obviously you're laying on your back. You're looking straight up, uh, up, up in the top. There's two cockpits and the top is where you have the windows. And I was sitting uh, there's two pilots in the front and behind the pilots sit two mission specialists. So I was one of those mission specialists. I was sitting behind the co-pilot and you're looking straight up. So for most of the launch, you're just seeing black. I mean, you see the as you launch, you'll see any clouds will race by the window and disappear. And as you go higher, the, the sky will get darker and darker until it's black. Uh, but all the while, the shuttle is going very fairly steeply up and, it's, and it leans over. 
and starts going horizontal, uh, eventually when the engines quit, you're up probably about 80 miles and still coasting higher. But now you're pretty, you know, the nose has come down. And that's the first chance you get to see the earth out the windows. As soon as you unstrap and you know float out of your seat right after the engines quit, you're able to see the earth. And the first time I saw the earth, it was, wow. I mean, it was you could see the curve of the earth, the black of space, the blue of yeah. the ocean. Uh, the white of the clouds it was so beautiful it was just uh just i'll never forget that ever <laughs> yeah so back to the space food conversation what was your favorite and what was your least favorite food well <laughs> junk food was my favorite eating butter cookies and m m's while looking at the earth <laughs> by the way a, a part of eating now is drinking uh if i gave you a glass of water and weightlessness and you went to drink it what's going to happen the water's just going to float out? No, it's no. not going to do anything. Really? In weightlessness, everything is, every position is identical. So the water doesn't know whether it's sitting in this way, this way. It doesn't matter. You can turn that glass upside down and you're going to be looking at that water, wondering how you're going to get it. Uh, so, you know, every position is identical. So the only way you can get that water and the way we drink is we have these pouches that we can fill that have different powders, you know, uh, coffee, tea, uh, various fruit drinks, things like that. And you, you have a machine that just like the machine that filled the plastic for the uh, food, it adds water to these pouches and you shake them up to dissolve whatever's in them. You put a straw on the end of the pouch and you suck from a straw. You have to suck from a straw to be able to drink in space. Mm -hmm. By the way, on the topic of weightlessness, uh, it's hard for humans to get their heads around this, but in weightlessness, every position is identical. We have a lot of words in our vocabulary right now that are that are only in our vocabulary because we live in a gravity gravity field, yeah. um, like drop, spill, lying down, standing up, sitting down. Uh, those are all words that came about because we can stand up, we can lay down, we can drop some, we can spill some, but in weightlessness those words are meaningless there's no such thing as standing up or laying down or spilling or dropping so if you had evolved in in if you were born and raised in in orbit and you you had a friend of yours from the earth come up and he saw you with some something in your hand and you released it and he said to you watch out you're going to drop it you wouldn't know what he's talking about the word drop wouldn't be in your vocabulary. You would have never heard the word drop because you can't drop anything away. This is just yeah. a little interesting thing there. Okay, go ahead. So what was your least favorite food in space? I don't think you said, <laughs> did you? Least favorite food was uh, they had a um, they had a dietitian. We got to select, the, they had a, a menu and you could select what you wanted to eat. And of course, a lot of guys would select, or a lot of the men and women that were flying would select things they, they really liked, like, uh, well, junk food and some other stuff. But uh, they also wanted you to eat vegetables up there. So they had some dehydrated vegetables, which are disgusting. Uh, one was eggplant, if you can believe that. It looked like a vomit inside of a, of a container. It was disgusting. Uh, yeah. That was the least favorite, I think, yeah. a menu item for everybody. <laughs> yeah. So did eating food in space impact your sense of taste when you came back to Earth? Or was it just... No, insane? it didn't. It, there was no change when you came back to Earth. But I'll tell you, there's a change in, t in taste up in space. And the reason for that is when you get in weightlessness, there's a lot of blood and fluid in our bodies right now that is that because of, of gravity here on earth it's pulled down uh but in weightlessness it's equally distribute equally distributes throughout your body so if you look at astronauts closely in space you'll see their faces are kind of puffy their eyes are kind of puffy uh, that's because they have a lot more fluid in their in their head it's sort of like having a cold and when you have a cold because of the fluid in your head you don't taste and smell things like you do otherwise so it's sort of like eating with a with a head cold uh, when you're in weightlessness. So the taste is, is not as strong as it is, as it is on earth. So they added a bunch of spicy type of foods uh, because that early astronauts complained about the taste of the food was kind of bland. So they added uh, spicier foods uh, up to eat up in space. Yeah. So 
could you tell us a little bit about your awards, including the Air Force Distinguished <laughs> Flying Cross? Yeah, I was uh, in the Air Force and I, I had a tour in Vietnam. I flew 134 combat missions in Vietnam. So those were the, the award you just mentioned, the Distinguished Flying Cross, was from my service in Vietnam. Uh, I think I have a NASA Space Flight Medal, which is obvious. You fly in space, uh, they award you that. Uh, and then I have a couple other uh, medals associated with my time in the Air Force. Um, we don't need to go through all of those, but the, I tell you, the the, the most, uh, I mean, I, I'm proud of my service in the Air Force. So in NASA, uh, when you fly in space, they give you an astronaut pin. Uh, well, they don't give it. You have to buy it because it's made of gold. And the, and the American taxpayer isn't going to buy you a gold pin. So you have to buy it yourself. Mm -hmm. But they do fly it. Uh, they put it in the in the space shuttle so it actually goes into space with you and they present it to you when you come back. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a it's a very pretty thing. It's uh, very simple. It, it's a shooting star passing through an ellipse. And that's something all astronauts are very proud of to be have a NASA uh, NASA astronaut pin. Uh, so yeah, it's yeah, it's really nice to have. How much did that cost? Well, probably well, probably a couple hundred dollars. Uh, it's made yeah. of gold, so yeah, probably I don't know, probably three three hundred five hundred dollars now with the price of gold. Maybe yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. It's five hundred dollars. Yeah. So what was the worst thing about being in space? The worst thing, well, there's a couple things that are unpleasant. Uh, first of all, not being able to take a shower uh, is certainly not something that is attractive to, to space light. But there's also physiological changes in your body. I mentioned one, this fluid shift that, that comes up and affects your uh, taste and, and sense of smell and taste. Uh, but also about half the astronauts get sick and vomit up there. Well, feel nauseous. And many of those end up throwing up. Uh, that's disgusting. Now, I was in the lucky half that did not have any nausea uh, effect up there. But believe me, when you're in a small volume like that and somebody's vomiting in a bag next to you, that sure doesn't do anything for you. Uh, yeah. And then uh, another thing, too, is that the this fluid shift causes the the discs in your spine to absorb more fluid and they push your vertebrae apart. So you end up growing taller. I was an inch and a half taller in space than I am now. Problem with that is it gives you a very bad lower back ache because the muscles of the lower back don't stretch right away to make room for this longer spine. And so you get a really bad back ache. And that stayed with me the whole time I was up there. I had a bad back ache the whole time I was up there. Uh, now I'm told that from people who fly on the International Space Station that it takes about 30 days of being in weightlessness before your muscles stretch out and that back pain goes away. So those that wasn't fun. Uh, back yeah. pain and being next to people who might be vomiting. Yeah. So do you think that alien life on other planets in other galaxies could be possible? I absolutely believe there's alien life elsewhere in the universe. I don't believe it's visited the Earth. In spite of all of these reports of people seeing them and being kidnapped by them, I'm sorry, I just uh, don't believe that's happened. Uh, yeah. But I absolutely believe they're out there. I think if they ever came to Earth, they would make a significant, unambiguous contact, and we'd all know they're here. But uh, the reason I believe they're out there is just the enormity of the universe. Um, I don't know, many of you probably have seen the pictures coming back from the James Webb Observatory that's looking back, uh, well, the Hubble Space Telescope, too, looking yeah. back very, very far to the beginning of the universe. Now, I once read on uh and it's been been out there quite a while that there are there are 10,000 stars in the universe for every grain of sand on earth now you think about that how is that how could that possibly be well when you look at look at one of those pictures those deep deep space pictures from James Webb or Hubble and they show uh, uh galaxies out that at the far edge of the universe right they show these galaxies. There are, in one of those pictures, there might be a thousand galaxies, They're just tiny dots, tiny dots, but they are galaxies with hundreds of millions of stars, and there's thousands of them. And the, the thing that is really 
incredible is they said with like one of these Hubble or James Webb's photos like that, take a grain of sand and hold it at arm's length. And the part of the sky that's blotted out by that grain of sand is what that photograph is of. So you imagine now how many grains of sand that you would have to, you know, take the photos of that particular deep, deep area that would cover the whole celestial sphere. And you realize how many trillions and trillions of galaxies and, and the stars in the galaxies. And now you think, oh, well, if there's that many stars, how many solar systems are there? And of those, of those billions of solar systems, how many of those are going to have conditions, planets that are good for life? And I, I can't, I can't help but believe that there's not a lot of them, that there's not many, many civilizations out there just by the sheer numbers. Now, yeah. a lot of scientists would argue, well, that doesn't necessarily mean there's life on any of them. You know, it's a very complex process that got you and I here through evolution and may not be duplicated elsewhere. Uh, but I don't know. It's just another scientist made the point that the only planet we know that has life has intelligent life, us. So maybe it is more common than, than we know. Nobody knows. I wish we could. I, I think that would be the greatest thing in the world is to know there's life elsewhere in the universe. But yeah, uh, it's going to be hard to know. Yeah. So um, would it be possible to play any type of sport in space? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, you need a bigger room. I mean, uh, anything that depends on gravity isn't going to work. You might have to come up with your own. You'd have to probably come up with a new sport because you can't. Uh, yeah. well, I guess you could have you could have three dimensional football. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how you would score it, how the out of bounds would work, or anything like that. But I guess you could have three dimensional football. Um, you know that yeah. sort of what you're seeing in FIFA right now. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's possible. You'd have to have a big room and and come up with some rules and have some refs and referees and yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah. I don't know what other sports, uh, you know, tennis, uh, again, I guess you could do it, It'd be, have, yeah. have, have a room though, that's keep the ball in play. Yeah. So how did you find the experience of sleeping in space? Well, that's bizarre. Uh, first of all, can you lay down in weightlessness? Is that a gravity word? Yes. Yeah. So you can't. In weightlessness, you cannot lay down. You can float. You can float in any position. So really, when you're in weightlessness, every position is identical. There's no standing, sitting, lying. So if you want to go to sleep in weightlessness, just close your eyes. You'll float around. You'll fall yeah. asleep. Uh, now, that's not the way to go because you will drift around and be touching other people or touching you know, your body. You'll come in contact with something. You'll wake up. So we have sleep restraints. They look like sleeping bags, but you're not laying in them. You're floating in them. It's just they restrain you. You pin them to the walls or the ceiling or wherever you want. And you would then zip yourselves in these things and you fall asleep floating inside these bags. Uh, it's weird. Uh, a lot of people, and I was included in this, uh, I had a hard time. I'm, I'm sure if you're up there for months, you're going to get used to sleeping in weightlessness. But I found on, a, on my short missions, it was very hard to get any sleep because, well, for a lot of reasons, but one of them was, is your body, I, your body missed contact with a mattress and with a pillow. I'd find myself dozing off and then waking up kind of thrashing around in this bag, trying to find contact that I was laying on something. So I didn't mm -hmm. sleep real well. And, and actually some people complained about not having a pillow. So NASA provided a foam block as a pillow, but think about it. You can't, your head's not going to rest on a foam block. Your body's floating. So how, how do you keep your head in contact with a pillow? They had a Velcro strap you'd pull across your forehead to pull your head into contact with that uh, pillow. Some people needed to do that to fall asleep. Uh, so sleeping was uh, was awkward. And and frankly, you, you didn't get very good sleep. And not on a yeah. shuttle mission. They were too short. You were yeah. not used to it. And another thing, too, it's a small volume. Of, there's noise. If somebody's vomiting next to you while you're sleeping, you're going to wake up for that. And uh, mm -hmm. and another distraction is if you're on a shuttle mission, you're thinking, well, I can sleep when I come back to Earth. I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to sit here and look out the window. 
And so eventually yeah. you do fall asleep, but you probably fall asleep just looking out the window. Yeah. So did you play any part in the design process of the mission patches for your missions? Yes. Uh, all the You see some patches on the behind me there. Those are, I only have three patches. Uh, you, don't, you can only see two, I think, in this. Uh, here, let me show you. Make tilt up there. There's the third one up there. So those three mm -hmm. patches uh, uh, that you see on the left and on the left there. Um, so uh, uh, crews design, they're responsible for designing their own patches. Now, one of, <laughs> a mistake that many, I think many crews make, at least they did in the shuttle program, is that when you start out designing a patch, most people have a big piece of paper and and they'll start saying, well, you know, we ought to have, since we're going to be having a telescope that's looking at an eclipse, oh, we need to have any uh, show of uh, the moon or the, or the, or the sun in, in an eclipse. And then on that same mission, you're doing a spacewalk. So we got to have a spacewalk on it. And you have all of these things. And it looks great when you have a big piece of paper and you have all this sketched in there. But then when it comes shrinks down to a patch, it look, does not look very good. So... Uh, the best patches, I think, were ones where the astronauts gave professional artists. There's all sorts of artists that's always right in NASA telling them, hey, they'd like to participate in, in a patch for the crew. But, and we, on my last mission, uh, it's hard to see. Maybe I can hang, I'll hold it up here to this patch right here. My last mission patch, let's see here. That's down here. This one right here. Oops. Let me tilt this down. Oops, there we go. That one right there. Now I'll go back to uh, to me. That one, I think, is the best patch. And the reason is we just told an artist, it's a military mission, make it look patriotic, and left it at that. And they came up, and the per this the woman came up with this great patch where the stars of the American flag are fading off into the stars of the universe. Uh, has a, you know, obviously a, uh, a uh, patriotic theme to it. But I thought that was the best patch. The other patches, I, I, I don't think they're quite as good because <laughs> non-artist astronauts had a, too much to do with them. <laughs> yeah. So if you but design a patch, get somebody that knows knows art. Yeah. So out of all your achievements and stuff that you have achieved throughout your career, which one are you most most proud of? Well, I'd have to say uh, the greatest thing that anybody who's a parent can be is the is a great parent. So the greatest achievement I have are my children. And my wife would be the same, you know, saying that, you know, that's that's our combined greatest achievement is raising great kids who are now raising great yeah. grandkids. Uh, but to answer it from a professional uh, point of view, the greatest achievement, obviously, was being an astronaut. And there's no question mm -hmm. about flying in space as an astronaut. Yeah. Although I'm, I'm proud of my time in the Air Force, too, in the American Air mm -hmm. Force, flying, in, flying in fighter jets. Proud mm -hmm. of that, too. Yeah. So, um what advice would you give to young people wanting to pursue a career as an astronaut? Well, obviously, education is critical. Get as much education as you can and make sure it's STEM education. Uh, the, uh, you know, obviously heavy in science and math. Uh, but if you're really, really, truly interested in, in looking to be an astronaut, Make sure, now for you folks, that would be under ESA, right? European Space Agency, I think, would be how you guys would have to apply in England to be a, yeah. to be an astronaut. So you, you ought to be looking at the ESA website on what they require to compete to be an astronaut and then look at the biographies of people who have been selected as ESA astronauts to see what they did in their life to be highly qualified. Uh, so that's that's the best advice I could give is is look at yeah. the education that's required by ESA and look at who have been selected and what education they had and other other uh, abilities to get selected. One thing too, it it's not just education. NASA and ESA uh, value uh, teamwork. They want people who can yeah. work together, different people toward the same goal. So make sure you get great 
team skills and learn how to be a great team player, how to be great and inspiring team leader. Uh, yeah. That counts a lot when you're trying to become an astronaut. Frankly, it counts a lot no matter what job and career you're looking for. Yeah. So um, could you tell us a bit about your experience as an author? Where? As, a, as an author. Oh, author, writing books. Well, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of experience. I've written a, a couple of books. I, my memoir, Writing Rockets, and then, uh, which is inappropriate for young kids. It's adult in content and places. Um, but I wrote a inspirational book for uh, uh, younger, you know, probably in the eight to maybe 12 year old uh, time zone or time zone, age zone uh, yeah. called uh, Lift Off an Astronaut's Dream. And then I wrote a space fact book called uh, Do Your Ears Pop in Space that answers 500 questions I've been asked as an astronaut. Writing is hard. There's no question about it. In fact, I think writing is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was writing writing my life story. So uh, anybody out there who's an author or is thinking to be an author, I uh, congratulate you because it's a lot of work. Yeah. So is there anything that you would still like to do in particular before you retire? <laughs> well, I am retired from being an astronaut. I, uh, yeah. I do still, I go out and talk to corporations now about teamwork and safety, but mm -hmm. I am a passionate mountain climber. I try to climb as many mountains as I can. I climb hundreds of miles, uh, hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of kilometers a year, uh, going up to tops of some very uh, high, uh, you know, above 4,000 meter mountains. So um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, I like that. I like doing that. So I'm going to continue to do it. I just recently uh, climbed a, but it was probably about a 40, 4,300 meter uh, mountain at age 77, which isn't easy. I'll tell you that right now, Colorado mountain. So I'm going to continue to do that. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for this incredible, incredible interview, Mike. It has been such an honor to speak with you. Um, so... Yeah. Well, very well done, Tom. I really uh, enjoyed the interview and I wish everybody the very, very best of luck and happy holidays. Okay. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.